Welcome to FCF Tucson, and thank you for visiting our broadcasts. Before we get into this message, we want to let you know that if you have any need for prayer or victories you'd like to share, you can let us know through the links in the video description below. And if you've been blessed by these teachings and would like to help us to reach others, you can securely give by visiting our website or clicking on the link again in the video description below. And lastly, please consider helping us to get this message out by sharing it or sharing our page with your friends and family. It is such an honor for us when you do. Thank you. And now, today's message. Well, if you got a Bible with you, look with me in Mark chapter 9. Mark, the ninth chapter. Hmm. I believe we're going to have to go old school here. The little wheel is spinning. Mark, chapter 9. Now, <clears throat> We've been talking at some length about all kinds of things, but about the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, all nine of them as they're, they're enumerated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we've actually talked about uh, eight and a half, probably eight and three quarters at this point. That's talking about working of miracles, and uh, we've been stuck there for some time. And in that discussion, uh, we stumbled over to, to uh, Acts chapter 19 where it said that uh, God was uh, doing unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. And one of the unusual miracles that he was doing by the hands of Paul uh, was driving out devils by sending cloths home with them uh, to take to the infirm at home. And we got to talking about, I say we, at least I got to talking about, uh, getting devils out of people, which is, uh, and, and, and the Pope caught up with me here a couple of weeks ago. God bless it. And uh, amen. Finally, finally caught on. And, uh, we found out that uh, they have more requests for exorcism than any time in recent history. They're training whole new legions of exorcists in the Catholic Church as we speak. So the, uh, we've been way out ahead of them, but it's a difficult subject just because, first of all, it freaks people out. But, but uh, to read the Bible and not at least address the subject is to, to leave out a whole lot of verses and, and pretend they're not there. So well, we've talked it for some length. If you're interested in the, the groundwork up to now, go look online. They're all up there on Tuesday nights. And uh, we started looking at the various episodes that Jesus has in the, in the Gospels where he actually addressed people who were demonically uh, influenced or, or demonized. We've, uh, I, I, surely by now I don't have to beat this horse again, but uh, demon-possessed is, uh, in the original Greek language, not in there. Because when we hear that, we, we have all kinds of strange, bad, late-night movie pictures. I know for some of you young folks, you don't know this, but they were showing horror movies late on Friday nights a long time before you were born. And uh, the, the technology's gotten better, but the theology is not any better. The... Uh, we need to know what the Bible says about the subject and how to recognize when it's a demon doing something. And we've talked at some length about that. And uh, in looking at the way Jesus deals with them, we pick up a few little pointers along the way. Now, we started out before we did this by emphasizing the thorough supremacy and authority that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ over demon entities. So uh, remember we saw in, in Luke's gospel that he told those fe fellows there that he had given them authority over all the power of the evil one, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Remember that? And uh, we have more authority than they did. We established that, hopefully, uh, in the fact that the name of Jesus that we use on this side of the cross was greater than the authority that they had from the incarnate Jesus on the other side of the cross, because it was at Calvary and in his resurrection that Jesus gave, Jesus gave the devil and his minions a good thumping. Amen. Amen. So the, the whooping has already took place. We're just in charge of enforcing the terms of the contract at this point. 
So, but we can learn things from looking at how Jesus dealt with demon spirits. Mark chapter 9, we, last time, uh, was it two weeks ago, I guess? That, uh, by the way, if you weren't here last Tuesday, you ought to go online and look at the message that, uh, that Valerie brought. She's our secret weapon. We sneak her in every once in a while, and she always has a really profound word, and she has certainly had one last Tuesday. I needed it. It was one of those thanks I needed that Wednesday morning when I listened to it. Amen. The, uh, we talked last time about uh, the, the so-called madman of Gadara, uh, which has always been one of my favorite stories. I like the names that these guys get through tradition, you know. Some people call him the Gadarene demoniac. How would you like to go through eternity with a name like that? I guess they just call him Gad for short. I don't know. Kind of like Doubting Thomas, right? Mark chapter 9, verse 14, we look at another instance here. It says, And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. Let's just stop right there and give a little background story here. Where, where was he coming from when he came here? Mount of Transfiguration. This is where he took Peter, James, and John up on the mount with him. And uh, Elijah and Moses appeared on the mountain with him and his face glowed. And, and uh, So I don't know this. This is just Stokes' reading of one word in a verse. But he, he came walking up because nine of the disciples are still down at the foot of the mountain, right? He took three of them with him. And apparently they were spending their time down here arguing with the scribes uh, while Jesus was up on the mountaintop visiting with Elijah and Moses and getting in the glory of God. And uh, his face started shining. Now my theory is, because it says here when he walked up, they were amazed. Now think about that for a minute. He's been walking around here all this time. But when he comes walking up, it says they were amazed. What were they amazed at? I think his face was still shining. I, <laughs> my theory on the subject. But... <clears throat> Be that as it may, he's been up in the presence of the Father with these other three boys while the other nine were down at the foot of the mountain arguing. That's where most of the people spend their entire Christian life is at the foot of the mountain arguing with their Christians. I, I always like to think they were probably arguing about whether a Christian can have a demon. That's usually what happens when you run into demonic forces is people fall into theological debate rather than uh, just dealing with the devil. So they were all amazed, and running to him, they greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? What are you arguing about? Interestingly enough, he didn't ask his disciples, he asked the scribes. You think maybe he already knew? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. What's a mute spirit? Huh? Yeah, the King James says dumb spirit. We don't say that anymore because it's not politically correct. Because people are too dumb to know that one word can have two different definitions and use them <laughs> contextually. So. Seriously. I mean, buy a dictionary for gracious sake. Anyway. If we're not careful, the whole language is just going to become so watered down that Shakespeare would never have been written. That's a whole other subject. So he has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples, and they couldn't cast it out? Now think about that for a minute. They couldn't cast it out. These are the same guys that have been out casting out devils in his name. But when this, this devil came along, they couldn't cast it out. <clears throat> he answered him and said, <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. 
and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, if you can, if you can't, and the, the King James is a little foggy here. Uh, probably 75% of the more modern translations translate it. Jesus said, what do you mean if you can? He didn't say, if you can believe. He said, what do you mean asking me if I can? I.e., of course I can. You believe. Of course I can. You believe. All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So, now, we don't know how this thing got in this boy. And generally speaking, it doesn't really matter where it came from. But for some reason, Jesus asked the father, how long has he been doing this? You know, and, and all the other interactions that he has with, with folks who are demonized, he didn't really ask them that. Now, remember last time we saw with the, with the gathering, he said, what's your name? So people take that one verse you know, and run off and say, before you can cast out a devil, you've got to know its name. Y'all laughing, I'm just telling you. Name yourself, name yourself. Well, no, you don't have to know its name. One half of a verse does not a do doctrine make. That would be a good thing for most of you to write down. But the, uh, if, if God was that interested in it, he would have put at least one more verse in there somewhere. But, but the, uh, uh, here he asked him, how long has this been with you? What, why do you suppose he might have done that? Any ideas? Now, uh, you remember in uh, John's Gospel, uh, when the old boy at the pool of Bethesda got healed, remember that? That's in John, what, nine? Five. Five. The, uh, after he got healed, remember, J Jesus went back and located him, and what did he tell him? Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Isn't that interesting? The implication there to me is, that that old boy got in that condition by his own hand. I don't know, I won't ask for a show of hands here, but I could say that certainly from the time I was about 13 forward, I could say for sure that 90% of my troubles were of my own making. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, but he doesn't say that to this, this young boy or to the father. He didn't say, Dad, you take him home and, and make sure he don't sin no more. But he said it came on him as a child. I believe that's why he asked that. I believe that he was trying to ascertain, is this a situation where the young man is, is, uh, bears some responsibility, or does this come on him for some other reason? Because if, uh, if he had nothing to do with it coming, then all we got to do is get it out and then train him up in the Word, and he'll be fine. That stokes his theory. There's absolutely no further uh, evidence for that other than just long experience and few scriptures about responsibility amen but the and my theories are just as good as yours probably better amen but so the, the it was an important question because if he was older he may have allowed it in and need to come to repentance and not just deliverance are you with me amen so how do demons establish their influence in the lives of people i I, w I was going a whole different direction tonight, and then this morning I just couldn't get off of this thought that uh, maybe folks need to understand it. You know, we, we have this picture somehow. I, I uh, had somebody not too long ago say they didn't want to be around where people were having devils cast out of them because they might jump on me. 
I said, well, I don't know if it's going to jump on you, but it ain't going to jump on me. If it does, it's going to have the worst day it's had in a long time. <laughs> Christian people filled with the Holy Ghost on a Bible, walking around scared, the devil's going to jump on them. Like just walking down the road, he just jumped out of a tree on me. It don't happen like that. <laughs> Then if, it, if they were going to jump on you, they'd jump on you. Why? Because they're everywhere. I mean, you know, but there's some places a little more concentrated than others. But just because you are around the devil don't mean you're going to get one. So how in the world uh, do people come uh, into the influence of demonic forces? How does that happen to folks? Amen? Well, one way, and, and one way that, I, I, that uh, people allow themselves to be conned into, especially if they're Christians, is, uh, I, how many of you ever been someplace where they talked about family curses? Well, you've got, you got a family curse. Well, now, some of that probably comes just from the, the people watching over the centuries and noticing that some families seem to have the same problem run down through the generations. Now we know that that's called genetics. Right? Amen. I mean, the men in my family are all over six feet tall. I don't know why. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Genetics. I mean, long people usually come from long people, don't they, Christopher? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but the same thing is true of some things that came to be known as a family curse. You know, different kinds of diseases and, and problems. You know, everybody in my... I've had people tell me all the men in my family die before they're 50. They have heart attacks. I said, number one, quit saying that. <laughs> number two, it, that's, they call it a family curse. It's not a family curse. It's probably genetic. I had a friend up in New York. The man ate nothing, nothing but saturated fats. I swear. It, and he tried to kill me. Every time I go see him, he said, let's go get a steak. I said, well, I really enjoy the steak, but, you know, could we eat like a I don't know, a broccoli sprout or something. I don't care. But something. But he ate nothing but saturated fat. Fried potatoes and steak. That was, you know, constant. Butchered cows in his basement. But that, really. <laughs> but when he went to the doctor, they said he had a cholesterol of 400 and something and not a clogged artery in his body. You know, there's a whole section of Italy whose, whose cholesterol is just through the roof. I mean, they're, they're, they just, you know, like drink olive oil out of the bottle. But, I mean, it's just the, the cholesterol of most of them is literally 300 and up. And they have almost no heart disease. What causes that? It must be the olive oil. No, it's the genes that cause that. Amen. There's nothing quite as good for your health as good genes. If you, if you have the opportunity to order some, then please do. But uh, at the, for most of us, it's a little late for that option, so we have to try something else. But uh, look with me over in Exodus 20. Even if you have some sort of a genetic issue in your family that gets passed down from generation to generation, A, not because you all got demons. You ever heard of familiar spirits? Now, I want you to listen to me now, carefully. Let's spell the word familiar. Ready? F-A-M-I-L-I. -I. Stop right there. Now, if you put a L on the end of the word instead of the R that we're about to speak, what will it spell? Familial spirits, okay? That's where that idea came from. Uh, there are people, once again, writing huge, long books, you know. Well, I think she's got a familiar spirit. You don't even know what that means, number one. <laughs> but number two, there are demons that are more familiar with you than other demons. Why? Because they, they, it's not because they're attached to you. It's because they watch you. Amen. And so sometimes they, they know just exactly how to get at you. And if people are in a particular family, there indeed are spirits that are familiar with that family 
and may be familial in their influence. Are you, am I making sense here? Okay. So once again, as people need to get a dictionary. But the, the, uh, here he's talking about curses. In verse 4, I had people come up and bring me this verse. He said, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. This is the Ten Commandments, by the way, in case you wonder. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. I had people come to me and show me that verse. They say, it says right here that God will visit the curse on the third and fourth generation. Now, what it says? It says that, doesn't it? But notice who it says he's going to do it to. People that hate him. How many of you hate God? Don't all raise your hand at once. He said he'll bring blessing. For generation upon generation upon generation for those that love me. So don't worship any idols and love God and you don't have to worry about family curses. <laughs> Seriously. Now, so uh, does that mean that the devil won't come and try to sell you what killed your mama and your grandma? Yeah. Of course he will. Why? Because that's easier to sell to you than anything else. And, you know, there may be a genetic connection, but your genes do not have to determine your entire future. I mean, you can't get much taller. You know, I mean, there's some things that some people have. Amen. I saw a fellow one time that was a, a, a midget, I mean, a dwarf of some sort, and had been in a mental institution and got hands laid on him and prayed for him and got saved. And uh, not only got delivered from whatever it was that had him bound up mentally, uh, but he grew to be over six feet tall. Became a missionary to the Philippines and worked for the Lord for 40 years. Jimmy something or other, can you remember his name? But pretty amazing story. I didn't believe it until I heard him tell it. I thought, I believe that guy's telling the truth. Because <laughs> he described the inside of that institution. I've been in there. I know what it looked like. So, he said that, you remember, think about it for a minute. Remember David and Solomon? You ever think about that? David and Solomon both fell to the same weakness in their flesh. Solomon, the wisest man in the world. According to that, God said that, not me. And who had, who had a heart toward God to the place when God said, whatever you want, just ask me. He said, I'd like to be wise so that I can be a blessing to my people. What a great heart. I just saw a commercial for a new Alpha that I thought, I might have to go over that. They just came out with a new sedan. You don't know what that is? An Alpha Giulia? Nice car. <laughs> Amen. But no, he went, he could have had anything in the world from God directly, and he said, How about wisdom? An understanding heart. I mean, what a precious heart. And yet <laughs> he fell into the sin of his father David. Because remember, Solomon was was an illegitimate child, essentially. Fell into the sin of his father David and wound up dying young. I mean, young for, for what we're supposed to live. 50, I believe 52. Let's say 52. When he died, he had uh, uh, a gazillion wives and, and uh, a bunch more concubines. Not sure how you tell the difference. I mean, after about the seven or 800th one, he must have some, some sort of an ID bracelet. I don't know. But the... But think about that for a minute. He intermarried. It wasn't just because he had a lot of wives. It's because a bunch of them worshipped devils, worshipped idols, and they brought them into the temple. He had them worshiping idols in the, in, the, in the palace. 
That's sad, isn't it? Well, is that a familial curse? Well, I don't know. I, I do believe that, that you, you have a tendency to learn how to live from the people you're around, don't you? So sometimes we have to kind of on purpose decide how God wants us to live. Amen. It could be genetic. It could be, in this case, I don't think it was inherited genetically. I think it was, it was taught by the culture in the house. We're all, we all learn how to deal with life, and it's usually not somebody told us. It's, it's just how we adjusted to exist in the atmosphere we're in. Sometimes we have to rethink that as we get older. So, the point is this. Uh, you, your familial curse has been broken because when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, you got you a new daddy. Yes. Amen. Galatians chapter 4, he said, you are no longer slaves, but sons. Amen. Uh, you're a son of God. First John chapter 3, he said, now we are the sons of God. Amen. Now we are the sons of God. Amen. What does that mean? Well, you could go into all kinds of depth, but the life of the flesh is in the blood. You got, uh, spiritually speaking, new blood when you came into the kingdom. Amen. So when the devil comes in and says, well, everybody in your family died before they're 50, he says, no, my daddy's still alive. He's been alive since before the foundations of the world. I mean, actually, my earthly father's still alive. He's just up there with my heavenly father. They're hanging out. Amen. But uh, when that comes to you, you have to recognize what that is. That's a lie from the devil. That you just have to, you know, well, my mama died of breast cancer. Well, that's too bad, but you don't have to. Amen. But uh, that's an easy lie to sell because, why? Because we believe... We, that's just our fate. See, it, it runs in my family. Amen. A lot of us need to run from our family sometimes, don't we? Just a thought. <laughs> not, I'm not calling any names, but that's just a thought. Don't let the devil that have dogged your family lord it over you. You are not cursed if you're in Christ. You're a son of God. Amen? Amen. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, we looked at this before, but let's look there, in the 13th verse. When I say before, I mean weeks ago. So. Your memory doesn't any better than mine, we probably need to look again. Colossians chapter 1 in the 13th verse. We have a resurrection. My Bible just came back to life. Verse 13. He, that is God, has, that's past tense, isn't it? Has delivered. That would be past perfect, wouldn't it? Speaking of memory. Has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, still subtended, but from the, the uh, verb has, has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He has delivered us and He has conveyed us. He has delivered us or set us free or brought us away from or broken the power of what? The power of darkness. Acts 26, he said, I will take them from the power of Satan unto the power of God, power of light. Amen? Here he says, from the power of darkness and conveyed us. The King James says, translated us. I kind of like that. It gives that, it gives that woof feeling like this. It wasn't a journey. It was just a woof. There we went. Amen. Amen. Translated us into the kingdom of his dear son or... Is it this translation? It says, the son of his love. I particularly like that for some reason. 
translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. We are delivered from the power, the exousia, the authority of darkness. What does that mean? Darkness can no longer tell us what to do. It has no rule over us. Now, in order for that to do us any good, we have to know we're delivered from it. And then number two, not be willing to allow the lie of the devil to get us to obey it. Does that make sense to you? Amen. The power of the enemy is broken in our lives at the new birth. Now, Matthew chapter 12. I'm taking way longer on this than I intended. Matthew chapter 12. Somebody must need it. Maybe it's me. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 43. It says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, this is Jesus speaking, he, that is the spirit, goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first, so shall it also be with this wicked generation. Now, he wasn't teaching about demons necessarily here. He was trying to let these guys know that we're calling them Beelzebub, that, that uh, maybe they had it wrong. But here he tells us something. He said, when the evil spirit leaves a man, then he eventually comes back and tries to get back in. Amen. And that you can count on that. There, there's always a, an opportunity to go back where you came from. Always, always. Now, under the old covenant, as he was speaking to these guys, uh, when an evil spirit went out of him, think about this for a minute, just meditate on it, because I have people tell me this all the time. God bless them. You want to just buy them a Bible and say, please read this and come back when you grow up. The... Uh, they could, and I, I heard this. When I first got saved, I was just as gullible as most people. You know, I listened to stuff, and I thought people all had sense. And so they've been Christians forever, so they must know more than me because I've been Christian for about 20 minutes. And, and so I'm figuring they know more than me, and I listen to them. They say things like, don't ever cast the devil out of somebody or lead somebody to the Lord uh, if you cannot disciple them and teach them. Because if you cast the devil out of somebody and you don't fill them up uh, with, the, with the Word of God, then the devil's going to come back with seven others worse than himself and move back in, and he'll be worse off than he was in the beginning. I actually had people say, do not pray for people to receive Jesus if you're not going to be able to, to, to disciple them. Okay, so what? Wait a minute. So you're telling me I should let them go to hell because I'm too busy to mess with them, basically. And I shouldn't set somebody free from a demon, come on, <laughs> if they're not going to come to church. That's what I, they, people would tell me. There's no use going out and casting out devil out of people. They're not going to come to church and grow up. Well, on that side of the cross, maybe that was true. But on this side of the cross, when you come to the Lord, you're no longer empty. <laughs> Amen. When you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. 1 John chapter 3 said, His seed dwells in you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, when we lead them to the Lord, uh, they get something. Now, there's some other stuff they can get. We can get them filled with the Holy Ghost. We can get them fill them with the Word of God. There's all kinds of other stuff we can teach them. But they are no longer empty once they come to Christ. Come on. Amen. So, Here's the point. There always is going to be the opportunity to go back where you came from. Always, always, always. And if you fall back into that, it is going to be worse the next time around. That was such a relief to me when I read it. Really. Uh, because there's a, a little principle about uh, uh, people with addiction. And that is this. The way to get bad fast is to quit for a while and then go back. Because it comes back on you just like you never quit. 
I always had this theory, you know, like every other addict. If I stay sober for like a month, then I can drink like I did when I first started out. I have like, you know, six years of easing into it. Not about six minutes. I started to say, I remember the last time I got drunk, but that's not technically true. I remember picking up the jug. I, I, I had been sober for weeks. Weeks. And so, and I had a particularly bad day at work. I was back at work. That's good. And I'm on my way home from work. It was a Wednesday. I remember it was a Wednesday. And uh, there was a little package store. You know what a package store is? A liquor store. Uh, between uh, work and my house, there was actually a lot of them, but there was one right on the street coming up to my house because you got to choose where you live carefully. And, uh, and <laughs> stop and think about that for a minute. People go make huge moves and don't even think about where am I going to go to church, where am I going to have fellowship, where am I going to get fed. Don't think anything about it. Man, when I would move, I'd make sure I was close to bars and liquor stores. Because, you know, in the condition I was in, you didn't want to drive a lot, so you wanted to try to be in walking distance if possible. If, if people would have anywhere near the diligence about making sure their spiritual needs are taken care of, as I was about making sure my addiction was taken care of, then we, we would be packed out. Anyway, just a thought. The, uh, but I, I remember going in, thinking, and here's the think, thinking process, okay, I had a really bad day. I did good. I survived. I, I deserve a little treat. And then the little voice comes, which would have been good. A cupcake or something would have been fine. But the little voice comes and says, you haven't had a drink in six weeks. You'll probably get to start over. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Put a little, yeah. Buttermilk, even better. And that. Uh, and so here's my thinking. I'll tell you what, I'll just have one. Right? And so th this tells you where I'm at. I'm going to have one, so I stop at the package store and I buy a pint. My mind, that's one. That's the last thing I remember for five days. <laughs> I guess I was at the races. I don't know. I was just going somewhere. Somebody, somebody had been coming in my apartment and making my clothes dirty and throwing them all over the room when I woke up. I don't know who that was. Turned over all the furniture and threw up on the floor. Called the police. They'd been a thief in there. No. It's easy to laugh at. That went a bit funny at the time. Woke up on Sunday afternoon about 12.30. Last thing I remember was stopping at that package store on Wednesday night. Hello. Well, what are, what are you saying? Saying that just because you've been dry for six weeks don't mean you can go have you a drink. Seven of his buddies comes right back with it. Amen. And that's not that's not just me, is it, Tom? That's a, that's a, that's a common knowledge phenomenon amongst uh, drunks and addicts. Is that uh, there ain't no getting better. It gets worse even when you're not using it. Anyway, so they, the demons will come and try to see if you know what, uh, that you've been delivered from the power of darkness. Because they will con you into letting them move back in the house. Now, so that's all talking about demonic influences. We started out talking about by familial right or by curses, about things being handed down. Once you know you've got a new daddy, once you know that the power of darkness has been broken, now it's up to you to just take authority over that stuff and tell it to leave you alone. Amen. Now, another way that people uh, find connection to demonic spirits is by living under the infliction of abuse, especially sexual abuse. Children who are sexually abused are often open to the influence of demonic entities. Those entities use their infantile thinking and their emotional responses as footholds to get a real deep hold on them. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you want to look at it.
verse 15. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. Now, I'm not uh, here to talk about the pros and cons of prostitution. What I am pointing out to you is that Paul, speaking by the Holy Spirit of God, said that when you have sexual relations with somebody even to whom you're not, because we usually think that two become one flesh applies only to the marital relation, right? Because Genesis chapter 2 was the uh, passage of primary reference on that subject uh, where Adam and Eve came together. But here, Paul is saying that when this individual that he's talking about here has sexual relations with a prostitute, that those two become one flesh. Is that in your Bible? That's one of those verses that most people don't ever think about much. And I don't think we have enough information from the rest of Scripture to get a full picture of what that actually means. But we do know that it means something happens. Now, some people, uh, you hear people talking about, you ever heard the term soul ties? Which is totally unbiblical. But the, uh, but, but the idea is not. But there's some kind of connection that made that has to be broken or else that relationship continues to have some sort of an influence in you if you're one flesh with somebody. When I talk with people in premarital counseling, I encourage them that you need to make sure that you are clean from all relationships you've had up to now. Now, if you got born again, you know, I, I'm, I'm a believer that those things are under the blood, they're gone, and it's cut off, and I'm a new creature. But if it still torments your mind, you still need to deal with that. Amen. But I believe that when children are sexually abused, sexually used would be a better term, that things happen to them spiritually, mentally, and emotionally that gives a foothold to the devil in their lives. Amen. I remember one precious lady. I have time to do everything I'm going to do, so I'll just tell one more story and we'll pray. <laughs> yeah. um, I think I might have shared this in another service. But uh, this precious lady had family, a couple of little kids. And, uh, you know, just... Look, look like something out of Ozzy and Harriet. I mean, I've been to their home, and sweet people, but she was having real problems with depression. They were having some marital issues and blah, blah, blah. And, because I've been listening to people's troubles for a very long time, and this was just another appointment to listen to somebody's troubles. I'm ready to go. I'm prayed up, good to go. Uh, they come in my office, and uh, she starts talking about how she's depressed. He starts talking about how she don't do this and she don't do that. You know, you know how to, anybody ever done marital counseling? You got her story, his story, and the real story. That's why I, I, I hate to talk to married couples separately. Because when you talk to the other couple, you think, were y'all in the same room? And this happened. I'd like to introduce you to a lady. She looks a lot like the one I thought was your wife, but apparently not. You're living with somebody else. <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, they're, they're sharing, you know, their perspective on things. And I can't even remember what we were talking about. I mean, what's, this is a normal-looking human. I mean, functional person, sort of, you know, and uh, I don't remember what we were talking about, but I just said something about a camera taking a picture, and all of a sudden, she just goes ballistic, I mean, I'm not talking about a little bit, I'm talking about banshee shrieks, crying, tears shooting out of her eyes. And that's it. She did. She was like that for like 30 minutes. You can't talk to her. You can't do nothing. All I knew to do was put my hand on her and say in the name of Jesus and pray in tongues. Until she finally calmed down. When she calmed down, she could not tell me what was the matter. They went home. We scheduled another appointment. What are you going to do? Next time we get together. I said, now, you know, last time we were talking about, and I reiterated what we were talking about, boom, she goes again. So we sat there for another 30, 45 minutes, praying in time. We, we did this for three or four sessions. 
I mean, at the end, she can't tell you what she's upset about. You know, I said, this is not in any of my textbooks anywhere. <laughs> you know, so what do you do? You praise the Lord. See you next week. <laughs> I had one lady, oh, God. <laughs> she locked herself in the bathroom. And we, I'm sitting outside the bathroom with her husband because she's afraid she's going to hurt herself. She was upset because she couldn't get all the stems off the raisins. I didn't know raisins had stems until I met this lady. They do. But she, she wouldn't let her children eat the raisins with the stems. I wish I was kidding. Anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> yes, that was the fight. Anyway, you're fighting about what? Okay. <laughs> You called me on my day off for that? Really? Don't eat any raisins till tomorrow, and I'll be in the office, okay? The, uh, <laughs> so anyway, about the third or the fourth time, finally, I mean, same thing happened every time, but it happened again, but this time, she starts to calm down, and the, she's not no longer hyperventilating. It's going, okay. I said, I just said, tell me what you're thinking about. She said, I remember. I remember. I remember. <laughs> what do you remember? <clears throat> she remembered being in the basement of her parents' home with her grandfather, who had a camera, who would charge his friends to come over and have lewd contact with her while he photographed her as a small girl. She, she had never, she totally repressed it, hadn't remembered it in, in, you know, what, 25 years? And while we were sitting there talking, when I said camera, pow, hello. Well, you know, we prayed when we started that God would bring things to light, so I guess you be careful what you ask for. Yeah, and he did. he did. But needless to say, we prayed for some deliverance. You know. Those things leave a scar. I don't care whether you think they did or not. And in this case, uh, he tells us here in 1 Corinthians 6 that there is a connection made that has to be severed. You know. Whether it's mental, whether it's uh, emotional, I don't know what it is. People, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us, but it says the two became one flesh, the prostitute and the man that used it. That begs the question then about fellows that have been out doing goofy stuff, getting themselves clean before they bring themselves into a holy bed. The Bible says the marriage bed is holy. Amen. You don't want to bring all them other people into the bedroom with you in this new relationship. Get them under the blood and leave them there. Are you listening? I don't mean to be uh, gross or harsh, but just, uh, obviously I've been doing this for a living for a long time. You know? And there are a lot of people out there. I'm talking about a lot of people out there. there there's, there's, it's not accidental that the Me Too movement is Me Tooing right now. You understand that? Amen. Children who are abused in those ways are open targets for demonic oppression of some kind. Amen. But I'm happy to report that we have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Let's stand up. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bow your heads for just a moment. I can just tell by the atmosphere that we got over on some people's sore spots just a little bit. Yeah. So just uh, ask the Lord to come in and sort it out, give you some direction. If you need to ask him to forgive you maybe for something, go right ahead. If you recognize some thinking in your own mind that you've been letting the devil get over on you and convince you that you're no good or that you're, uh, you know, nobody in my family has ever done this or that or the other. My daddy created the world. 
pretty slick. Amen. Amen. If you've been standing against something or, or, or have been uh, bothered with the thought of some sort of a family hereditary condition, then I want to pray with you, if you'd like. Do we have anybody in that condition? Got a hereditary issue, something that's been ha- handed down in your family? We want to break that? Come on, come on up here. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can you all stretch your I don't say stretch your hand. Stretch your faith out. I don't care what you do with your hand. Father, I thank you for these precious ones. These are your children, every single one of them. I know these people. These are children of Almighty God. They're heirs of God. Heirs of God, co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ, sons and daughters of Almighty God, no longer slaves to the law, no longer in the bondage of their natural heritage, but living in the fullness, in the fullness, in the fullness, in the fullness, in Jesus' name. Fullness, fullness, fullness. Fullness of the Urabahashike, the heavenly Father. Fullness. Urabaka. No more, no more, no more, no more. Urabakashike te brofa kadalaba shukutu brofa. Broshke de brifa sanga da broka talishinga na bro rabakanda de shika. Urabakanda la mashoko do brofa katali bezdeke. Urabak in the name of Jesus. Devil, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Umbra kateli basafa. Ora bakande di bezdeke ndo broko tolo basike. Mombro kodolo shia kanda risko to brofo. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Ora bahashike tembrofa katala basaka. Umbro kotolo bosh. In the name of Jesus. Ha. Translated. Translated, translated. Umbra kateli baje kete brofa kateli zdekris katama. Ora bakanda la mashi kete bro. This is a son of God right here. In the name of Jesus, this is a son of God right here. This is a son of Almighty God right here. Oh, and in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we call him free, free, free. Mind, body, and spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, Rabbi Katara, Heavenly Father, wrap him in your arms. Encourage him. Strengthen him. Let him see how you see him. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, delivered from the power and authority of darkness, conveyed, swept, translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. Thank you, Father. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.